All right, good morning, everybody, and good morning, all of our friends on Facebook and on YouTube. Uh, good morning, Revolution to all. Uh, Scott, hello. Hello, hello. We're joined hello. this morning by uh, um, Anita Waters, uh, who's a sociologist and um, uh, professor of sociology, and also a uh, member and, and organizer and leader in the Communist Party. Welcome, Anita. Thanks. Thank you very much, Scott and Joe. Good morning. Uh, and that's Professor Emerita, by the way. I, I retired from grading papers, so I'm, <laughs> I'm free. Okay. Well, we're All really right. happy to have you. And Thank before you. we get started, we want to encourage everybody to start a watch party. You can do that by just simply clicking on Start Your Watch Party button uh, on your screen. Uh, so that you can share the socialist wealth with your friends and neighbors, help uh, spread the word. Well, it's been quite a week this week. Um, it looks like the, that there is a groundswell developing in the country in favor of a pe uh, impeachment, beginning, I think, with the uh, scandal surrounding the, the Ukraine. And then most recently, uh, Scott Trump's uh, decision to withdraw the uh, US troops uh, in uh, uh, the Turkey-Syria uh, border area, which allowed the president of uh, Turkey to begin a military campaign, incursion. A campaign against the Kurds. Yep. Uh, a terrible, terrible act. And by the way, we have a statement on that that we're going to get up uh, today. Um, so, uh, do you think, Scott, that uh, the uh, uh, House is going to impeach and the Senate convict? Or well, well um, let's hope so. I mean, uh, you know, from everything we've heard, the votes are there in the House to impeach. Um, but, you know, I think the, the Democrats are, are um, you know, they're wise to, to, to do this carefully above board by the book, et cetera, you know, um, um, because the, the emphasis here really is on whether the president is subject to any kind of oversight, any kind of checks and balances. And it's really a, a democratic issue. The real groundswell, I think, is for getting rid of Trump, um, you know, through as soon as possible, through impeachment and conviction, if we can, and if not that, certainly through the through the next elections. Sure. How does it about accountability? Absolutely. How does it look in Ohio, Anita? Well, I think there is a real groundswell of uh, protest. Uh, I saw there was a demonstration and a petition gathering for um, Rob Portman uh, to get him on on board with a number of things, including just not standing by Donald Trump, no matter what Donald Trump does or uh, says. So uh, we're constantly keeping up the pressure on uh, Portman. Of course, uh, our other Senator, um, Sherrod Brown is, is uh, very much um, in our, on our side in this, I think. Uh, but Rob Portman is really uh, a key. He has um, made a mild criticism of uh, Trump on this, but we, uh, he's still the, um, in charge of Trump's reelection campaign in, in Ohio. So he hasn't stepped mm. down from that role yet. Interesting. Well, do you, do you think, Scott, that there is any chance uh, for the Senate to, um, in a trial of the president, to convict, or do you think it's a waste of time? Uh, I think um, even the, the I, I do not think it's a waste of time at all. I think it's a, it's, it might be a long shot to convict, but putting the president on trial in the Senate um, is, you know, would itself be a big step. And again, you know, think about the accountability always flows downhill, right? Um, you know, think about what working people have to go through on the job, the, the random drug tests, the background checks, the evaluations. Um, the president of the United States, the most powerful person in the world says that he doesn't have to even, you know, obey the, the very basic requirements of accountability in his job. So this is a, a huge democratic issue and I wanna see him standing in front of the Senate. Um, mm -hmm. answering for this. And if the, if senators don't have the, the backbone to, to convict, then, you know, the people have to provide that backbone for them. 
<clears throat> some people say it's a waste of time because the Trump has such a strong uh, uh, support in the Republican base. It's like 80, 90 percent. And so they're like, this is a futile exercise. Why waste your time? I think that's an excuse um, to defend the president without appearing to defend him. <laughs> but Anita, according to you, um, Trump's ally in Ohio, uh, the uh, senator, the good senator, is beginning at least to offer some, you said, mild criticism? Exactly. And I think, uh, yes, maybe 80% of Republicans are still standing by their man right now, but um, that uh, the the number of people who are uh, admitting to being or or identifying themselves as members of the Republican Party is a diminishing uh, group as well. So I think if you look at the um, you know who would you vote for, who what party would you vote for tomorrow? There is uh, people are are not happy in the majority with uh, with the, this president, and I think um, if we see an alternative in in 2020, I'm sure he'll be defeated. Let's hope so, but we got to do more than hope. We got to keep the pressure on. That's right. the important thing. <clears throat> and as the uh, poll shift, so too will the uh, attitudes of Republicans in both the House and the uh, Senate, I think. Um, and uh, so a lot depends on what happens on the ground. Uh, uh, but it, it's interesting though, that some on the left have uh, taken uh, since the, the Speaker of the House, Mrs. Mrs. Pelosi, has changed her mind, some on the left, most notably DSA, have come out against impeachment, which is a kind of an odd thing. Don't you think, Scott? I mean, uh, I, I, I think that's yeah. very odd. Um, I'm not sure, you know, I haven't read their, you know, their, their position or their, their statements on it, but um, it, it sounds like the, the, the self-defeating tactic of, of saying that you know, because this is not uh, fully under the control of, you know, of the working class or, or whatever, um, then it's, you know, then it's nothing. We have to remember this, the fact that we're, that impeachment is on the table is because of the mass movement that has kept the pressure on all these years. It's not, this is not just Nancy Pelosi suddenly deciding to do the right thing. This is, this is the people. Uh, right. And let's remember that it was uh, the squad, uh, uh, AOC, and uh, the other uh, three women, uh, Ilhan Omar and uh, uh, Representative Presley and others who have first put out the call for impeachment, uh, including uh, the sister from uh, Detroit, uh, who said uh, it is time to impeach uh, that expletive deleted. <laughs> we well, uh, wasn't there a, a representative from, from Texas who- uh, Oh, by the way, yes. In, um, a couple of years ago on grounds of sort of Trump's uh, racism and whites. We gotta, we gotta remember that this is, you know, whatever we get him on is great, but everything about him deserves impeachment. So he, was on, he was on the front row on that issue. By the way, there's a wonderful article by C.J. Atkins uh, uh, in peoplesworld.org, which we would encourage you to read, uh, on the issue of impeachment and the role of the left in that regard, where he takes up these issues in a very, very, very fine uh, way. Well, other things that are going on in the country, there are wildfires in California, just above Los Angeles, and a big electrical outage, Scott, Yes, uh, so from, on the left coast. From what I've understood, the um, PGE, the the um, the electric supplier uh, in California, it has cut power to about a million and a half people um, out of worries that that sparks involved, in, I suppose, in the transmission process uh, could could spark more wildfires. Um, and this is, I mean, this is shocking uh, because one of the things we always hear in capitalist sort of propaganda about socialist countries is the rationing and the lack of basic necessities. Like, oh, you know, um, Cuba doesn't have power, Venezuela doesn't have food, China doesn't have this, you know, Soviet Union didn't have that. Um, and now we see kind of the, the reality of this, that, that capitalism is also incapable of providing those basic necessities and incapable of addressing the climate crisis, which is what's behind these wildfires. Um, so how, I mean, 
this is obviously the absence of power is a, is going to impact you know poor and, and working class people uh, really heavily. How do you think that's going to play out, Joe and Anita? I think, can I weigh in? I think the, uh, the ownership, uh, private ownership of, of utilities is probably the root of, of that problem. Um, we're dealing with that problem in, in, uh, in Ohio right now over um, uh, First Energy Corporation owning um, a, a lot of plants that really should be out of service. So, um, but I, I, I heard Gavin Newsom, the, the, uh, the governor, California objecting to uh, the way the utility company in, in California is handling this. So uh, I, I think they have to be brought into line and, and serve people's needs instead of uh, serving shareholder interests or whatever. Well, Anita, you've written an article recently for uh, cpusa.org on the subject uh, uh, in which you address Karl Marx's concept of, it's kind of a big, big word phrase, a metabolic rift. That's uh, right. In which you uh, seem to argue that Marx kind of foresaw uh, some of the uh, uh, problems with regard to uh, the exploitation of uh, nature um, and the depletion of, of uh, the earth's resources, and in particular soil, um, and, uh, and that this problem would persist in, and deepen unless there were steps taken to reverse it completely. Uh, you want to develop that idea a little bit? Sure. Um, I really depend on, on uh, when I'm thinking about this or what I know about the metabolic rift um, concept really comes from uh, a, a sociologist, a Marxist sociologist, uh, at University of Oregon, John Bellamy Foster. And he's really the one who, um, who uh, developed this concept of metabolic rift. He found it not in the early philosophical manuscripts uh, uh, part of uh, Marx's uh, writings, which environmentalists have pointed to over and over again when they wanna look at humans and their relationship with environment, but instead from uh, his later work in Capital, on the political economy, um, mainly of, of agriculture, uh, which was the big environmental crisis of the day. Uh, there was a discovery of, uh, in the course of the 1800s of soil depletion. And in turn, there was uh, advances in agricultural uh, chemistry and agricultural sciences uh, that showed that um, soil fertility could be uh, maintained or improved with the addition of, of certain pro, uh, um, products from around the world. Mainly, the, the big one is guano, which is seabird dung deposits that were found in uh, islands in the Caribbean and off the coast of Peru and in a number of places. Of course, that's a very not renewable resource. Once you, I guess it's renewed in a very slow way, but once those mining uh, mines were um, exploited at great cost, um, there wasn't uh, there there wasn't enough uh, soil enhancement for every farmer, of course. So um, what Marx really saw in this was uh, technology um, improving a re re recognition of soil improvement possibility, but the social relations weren't caught up to that, and so capitalism could never use the scientific um, breakthroughs effectively. Um, instead, it, it relied on these deposits and, and other materials from, uh, from different places that were brought in at great cost, uh, instead of changing the social relations themselves uh, that, uh, that really caused the problem. So the metabolic, metabolic rift re refers to this um, this divide between human labor and the natural world in which it came from, or really the rift between uh, humans and nature. And uh, it was, uh, Marx saw it as a kind of an echo of this town versus country rift uh, that he saw as part of the big, uh, first big division, one of the first divisions of labor in humanity. So uh, there's a real, in a, uh, a real, um, distorted relationship that capitalism brings 
uh, to uh, the connections between humans and nature. I see. Well, Scott, you were telling me this this morning that you thought that maybe you had some questions about whether or not the issue is caused by private property and land and, and whether or not the solution is public ownership. So let, let not, uh, not exactly that. Not distorting your views uh, or what? So I guess, first of all, I want to, I mean, I, this concept is really exciting for me. I'd heard of the metabolic rift, but never, you know, I didn't know the, the background of it in, in Marx's writings, in the sort of uh, scientific uh, debates of the day. Um, and I think what's great about it that Anita brought out is, it, you know, facing our current environmental crisis, we, we see all these, these calls, we see this approach that says there's just not enough. So we're not consuming in the right way. So we need, you know, um, in these new like uh, synthetic meat replacements, or we need this or that new technology. And these technological advances are gonna somehow get us out of the environmental bind uh, that we've gotten ourselves into. But what Marx brought out and what Anita sort of brought, brings out as well is, is that it's the underlying social relations. We're not going to, right. the capitalist crisis, and we're not going to just innovate our way out of it. We have to transform our way out of it. Mm -hmm. um, so my, um, my, my question was on a specific aspect. So Marx argues that the, the solution to um, this metabolic rift involves making all uh, land, productive land, um, communal uh, property. Um, and, you know, I come from a rural area uh, with a lot of, of small farmers who are, who are suffering. And, and I think a place where people are really conscious of this, they feel this rift, right? Everybody in whatever their political persuasion views are, they, they want natural food, they want local farms, they want, um, there, there's this, I think this, this feeling that somehow our relationship to nature has been distorted. Um, I guess what I, what I wonder is, um, is the demand to, to collectivize uh, f farmland, like what will that look like under socialism in the United States and, and how will it be different than, you know, maybe steps that were taken in the USSR or China? Well, that's a really good question. Um, I, and, and I think, um, I mean, I think Marx uh, and well, Foster uh, was very uh, um, mindful about pointing out that it, a transition to socialism alone wouldn't even uh, 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 solve the problem. Instead, you really need planning um, and you need a more even dispersal of, of humanity across rural and uh, urban uh, areas. So I think um, the idea of collect collectivizing farmland in, in uh, in isolation of other um, uh, structural changes in, in our economy would be uh, just hard to imagine even. And I think, but I think you're right, the, 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 the movements that we see now, I think Marx was one of the first, uh, could have been the, the, the founder of the local food movement because he uh, does talk about um, the, the, the uh, growing distance that, um, food travels uh, from the um, farm to the urban table. Um, and that, that is part of that, that, that divide. Uh, so, um, so I think, I mean, I bet I can imagine where you are, uh, Scott, you might have some uh, farmer's markets and people are really um, keen to uh, purchase uh, their food from people who grow it uh, locally. And I think that is, that is kind of a, a, a um, a human uh, desire to to overcome that rift on a small scale. Well, these are interesting questions, and we're opening up a, a discussion, a debate um, at CPUSA.org on precisely some of these issues. Isn't that right, Scott? How do people participate in it? So um, you can go to our website, www.cpusa.org. Uh, the first thing you'll see at the top will be. Um, uh, a picture of a bunch of people with a climate banner and a, a thing that says, um, you know, uh, join the discussion, a little button, click that. You'll see some, uh, a question, uh, some resources that the party, kind of from the party archives, um, contributions from members, um, including uh, Anita's article. Um, 
if you want to get updates about these discussions, uh, the best way is to join our text message service. So if you have your phone handy right now and you're not yet getting texts from CPUSA, send a text to the number 555-888. What you will put in the text message is just the name Marks. Um, and that will subscribe you to our text alert. So when we're having webinars, when we're having uh, these, these discussions, um, events, whatever, uh, you'll get notices about them. Um, for me, it's really the best. I, I rely on that more than email. Text 555-888-MARX. Is that what you're saying? Yep. Text the name Marks to 555-888. marks Well, you know, uh, Anita, the idea that Marx uh, was the head, I wanted to be the head of the first local food co-op, uh, <laughs> interesting one. Um, you know, you ended your article um, uh, pointing to a sign that was uh, mm -hmm. held up by a protester at the local, at the most recent uh, climate strike, which said that only capitalism can solve the, I'm sorry, only... <laughs> Where, where was the sign again? It was like, uh, it, it, in order to solve the climate uh, strike, we have to, I mean, the climate uh, crisis, we have to end uh, capitalism. We have to end and capitalism. I thought that really summed up what this article, uh, what, what Mark said in his argument about metabolic rift, that really, um, that real transformation of social relations has to be what's happening. And that's why I think approaches like, um, I think the Blue Green Alliance has a sustainable development approach, um, the Green New Deal, uh, the idea of just transition that unions have come up with. I think all of these recognize that the, um, the, the need for real change in our social and economic relationships, that's what really undermine, uh, um, will be the foundation of, of uh, solutions to the global crisis. And I was asked that question recently in an, in an interview, you know, Joe, do you think that uh, these problems can be solved under capitalism? Um, to which I answered no. But then I said, you know what? Uh, it's kind of a weird question because on the one hand, theoretically, the answer is no, but actually you got to struggle today to take concrete measures to solve the problem real reforms now, today, in the present, in order to get to the socialist future. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just like fighting racism. Do I think the rate that racism can be solved or sexism under capitalism? No, but unless we take measures to address them now, we're never gonna get there. So it's that kind of, uh, you know, issue as well. And the struggles for progress here and now is what builds the organization and the strength to right. get us to the point of social. Right. I think another example is healthcare. I think struggling for healthcare for all uh, is a way of exposing the, the, the nefarious effects of profit in, in uh, help providing people healthcare. So, well, uh, we're going to dig into struggle. more of these issues at cpusa.org and uh, on our Facebook page. Unfortunately, we've run out of time. It's gone quickly. Thank you, Anita, for joining us. Very well, thanks for having me. It was an interesting, uh, 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 stimulating topic, Scott. Uh, one quick announcement before we leave. Um, this, uh, later this month, we're having a two-part webinar uh, with Mark Brodeen, uh, also on the topic of the environment, the environmental movement, um, and the, the struggle, how the struggle is shaping up here and now. Um, that'll be October 20th and 27th at, uh, well, I forget the time. Um, you can find it either on our Facebook page or on our website, and you'll get a text alert about it as well. Um, be sure to register. Uh, our goal is to get at least 200 people registered and have at least 100 people attending in real time uh, for those sessions. Um, and it should be great. Thank you. You can prepare for it once again by reading Anita's fine article on the metabolic rift at cpusa.org, where you will find other introductions to the topic. So once again, thank you both. And uh, we'll see you next week. Take care. Bye, Joe. Bye Scott. Bye. Bye, Bye Joe. Bye, Anita. Bye, Joe. Bye-bye.